Hello, Internet. Gino, that brings you to Grieco here again with another episode of Deep Listens. And today is a time for giving thanks. It is our Thanksgiving adjacent episode. And today, in honor of Thanksgiving, we are giving thanks to our loyal patrons and our loyal listeners and all the fans out there. We have decided to take a suggestion game from our listeners, and so we have played Mega Man Battle Network 3. I have played Mega Man Battle Network 3 Blue, and I'm not sure if the person who's joining me, Pete Mega Man Busby. Uh, did you also play Blue? Uh, no, I played White. Excellent. But as far as I can tell, there's only like one difference between the two. Regardless, happy to be here to discuss a game that ended up being way deeper than I thought it was going to be initially. Yeah. In honor of Mega Man and this game that's based around the internet, I have a fun fact about printing presses. Oh, thank mm. goodness. So I don't think I've used this one before, but it's one of my favorite fun facts. So Gino, do you know why they're called uppercase and lowercase letters? Were they literally one was on the upper part of the typewriter and one was on the lower part of the typewriter? Yeah, pretty much. So when they were like creating movable type, they look put the uppercase letters on the upper shelf because they're used a lot less often than lowercase. So you don't want to, you know, be reaching for the letters you need all the time. And that's how they became uppercase and lowercase letters based on the physical layout of printing shops. Oh, very interesting. That's not about an animal, but it's also an interesting no, fact. But it's delightful. Every once in a while I like to switch it up. Humans are animals. That's so true. This is fine. Um and today, unfortunately, there were scheduling issues, so M was not available to discuss Mega Man. Uh, she might be joining us later on in the show, depending on availability. So if that happens, we will give you a heads up, and then all of a sudden, then we'll be talking. So make sure you stay till the end. Yeah, to find out. So before we get started, uh, let's do a few things. One, I've got my new gimmick. Hey, hey. And I, I'm going to call it, let's try, let's try this name on for size, Gino's Obsession. That's pretty good. It's got sort of a single white female feel to it, but that's fine. Doesn't it? It's a little bit – It's it describes that I really appreciate something, but it's also a little upsetting. It's a little sinister. <laughs> yeah. So this week I'm obsessed with the new album by uh, Medeon. Who is Medeon? What is Medeon? He's a French EDM or techno – what do we call it now? EDM, I guess. I don't know. House music? House – Something adjacent. So uh, he has a new album called Good Faith that came out just a few, so November 15th, so a little over a week ago. Um, he had not released an album since 2015, and I would right. describe his early sound as Daft Punk and very Daft Punky. I like Daft Punk. His adventure album, I listened to the hell out of it. Uh, it was really good. And because Daft Punk now doesn't really make songs that often, and when they do, they use studio music and don't use samples quite as much, I appreciated an album that seemed very inspired by Daft Punk, but not quite the same. It was more like older Daft Punk, like Discovery era. And then his new album, which came out this week, has a little bit of that Daft Punk feel still, and it almost feels like a Moby album, too. Hmm. Moby. It's got a lot of uh, gospel and... That those sorts of samples. Did you ever did you ever hear the story about when like Moby met Lana Del Rey? No. So like they're like going through Moby's house and he's like giving her a tour and like showing her all this stuff. <laughs> and Lana's like, "Wow, Moby, you're the man." And he's like, "Oh, thank you." And she's like, "No, no, no, you're the man. You're the one we guillotine in the uprising." Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. And did Moby go? That's also true. Yeah, like, accurate. He didn't seem super upset relating the story. Like, it's, he is. He's the man. Also, Lana Del Rey is one to, really not one to throw stones. <laughs> no, she's not. I do love her, though. Yeah, she's very sad. She is. She's among the saddest pop artists we have. Uh, Billie Eilish, though, and Lordy, or Lord, they are coming for it. Billie Eilish, definitely. I think they came by their sadness a little bit more authentically than Lana Del Rey, but this is this is neither here nor there. Um, so I would say the album Good Faith, it's very good. I like uh, the songs Dream, 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 All My Friends, and Fear No More. I think those are the standout songs on the album. Um, all of them are very nice, but it's a nice album to listen to while you're also working or doing something else because it's it's got some beats. It, it'll make you move, but it is not so vocal heavy. 
that it draws focus that much. Okay. So it's nice to have on the background of a party. It's good party music. Good obsession, Gina. I support this one. Thank you. All right. So on to the next bit. If you want to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash deep listens. If you support the show, you can get access to our Discord. And you can also get in touch with the show by sending in emails or tweeting at us at deep listens pod on Twitter, deep listens.libsen.com. We've got comment sections and deep listens podcast at gmail.com. We do not have any feedback. However, I will be taking over the discord report because M is not here to do it right now. So Um, so on the Discord report, we have created a new channel called Poke Talk because everyone's been playing Pokemon and it was taking up too much of the video game section. I have gotten into Pokemon as well. That game's really good, and we've been discussing it and coordinating trades. Mm. I don't know if you've seen the new Pokemon game. We're probably going to record an emergency podcast on that. I was super into it at like the Diamond and Pearl stage. Like I got real into EV training and the whole deal. Nice. But I sort of dropped off after that. Oh, you should. So I should. I should return. Let me tell you. I don't know if you have a switch or access to a switch, but let me tell you about gigant Dynamaxing Pokemon. <laughs> Dynamaxing. Dynamaxing. <laughs> okay, you take a Pokemon and you shoot it up with Dynamax energy, and when okay. you do that, it grows gigantic. Like, literally gigantic. Like, literally huge. So I knew there was, like, like Mega now, like Charizard, and then, like, this Charizard is different. Max. This is a separate thing. This is different. The, the, okay. the Mega Evolutions are, like, mid-battle evolutions. That's a, that's a thing. Right. But Dynamaxing is a thing you can do in certain, like, gym battles or uh, in the wild area, which is an area where, like... Other characters, other players will roam around because it's net, mm. you know, web enabled. Okay. Um, and you can do raids against Dynamax Pokemon. That sounds very cool. So there were, I fought a Dynamax Caterpie. <laughs> it's a gigantic Caterpie that's maybe four or five stories tall. It looks like the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man <laughs> situation with like dark ominous clouds that show up. What are you using Pokemon to Dynamax? I mean, any Pokemon can be Dynamaxed. What if you just Dynamax a Metapod and it just hardens over and over again? So once a Pokemon is Dynamaxed, it will replace its normal moves with Dynamax moves. Okay. So they will pretty Smart. much just be the, like, it cares about what element the move was, pretty much. So if okay. you had a, you know, bug move, it'll be a bug Dynamax move. And they will do a bunch of damage to whatever it hits, and then I'll, they'll also change the field. So, like, if you use a water move, it'll start raining after you use the move. If you use, like, a grass move, grass will grow, and it'll boost your next... Uh, I think it heals both uh, allies and enemies after every turn. So, like, it affects the stage. When you beat a Dynamax Pokemon, they explode. <laughs> uh, you fight four-on-one because it's like a raid. I like this. I support all this. I might have to get back into it. If you catch a Pokemon you that's Dynamaxed, you can catch them. You Dynamax your Pokeball, so the Pokeball becomes huge, and you throw it with two hands, like, over your head like it's a giant <laughs> soccer ball. This is getting increasingly ridiculous. And when you when they get trapped in the Pokeball, it, cl it just slams to the ground like it's a boulder and breaks the earth and then shakes like a regular Pokeball. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll explore this, but I, like Gina said, we'll discuss this more in the full podcast. Yes, so that is what's going on right now in uh, the Discord. It's mostly a lot of Pokemon talk, and that is also why uh, this podcast, M was not necessarily able to play enough of Mega Man because she was playing too much Pokemon. She was familiar with it from the past, though. Yes, yeah. we, uh, Her and I have both played Mega Man Battle Network. So, without further ado... Let's talk about Mega Man Battle Network 3. Let's do it. What, what is Mega Man Battle Network 3? Before I get to that, there's something I have to, to get off my chest. Please do. Is the is the kid's name pronounced Chode? Uh, I don't think it is. I, think, I thought it was Chod. Chod? 
Okay. But I it's It's just text, so like I think no it's French. Oh, that'd be show then. Show. It's the French word for hot. Yes, that's it, because he's very hot. Okay, so it's just show. Okay. Yeah, it's Because I've been saying it showed the whole time. That's great. And every time Mega Man says to land, jack me in, it sounds dirty. It's the best every time he says it. Jack in, Mega Man. <laughs> jack me in, land. All right, so now that we've gotten the important stuff out of the way, Mega Man Battle Network 3, you play as Lan. He's a net battler, so yes. he goes online and you know he fights with his avatar, Mega Man. His net navvy. Yeah, his net navvy, thank you. Against other net navvies on the internet in various sort of tournaments and fetch quests and side quests and job things. And as you're you're doing these battlings through, it's, it's almost like half card play, half real-time combat. Like you fight on a grid based on these card actions you have that map to certain button inputs. But he's going through all these battles. And over time, a conspiracy develops where the WWW, I don't know what it stands for. Uh, the World Wide Wet, Wiley? I, yeah, that's, I, that's what I assumed. I'm not sure what... It's Wiley is definitely in there because yeah, it's so, Dr. Wiley. Well, I'm going to say Worldwide Wiley. So Dr. Wiley is trying to create this conspiracy to raise Alpha, which is sort of like the Ur computer virus, to wipe out everything by accumulating the four Tetra codes. And you, Lan, net battler extraordinaire, with the help of your friends and friendship and your bond with Mega Man, have to stop Wiley. And this game is surprisingly prescient in a lot yes. of ways. It came out in 2003. Yes. And it cannot be emphasized enough, the internet in 2003, it was definitely getting widespread at that point. Definitely not to the degree that this game kind of foresaw. And we're we're definitely going to have a lot to talk about once we get to the story. Why don't we start with the combat system? Because I feel this game's best analog in terms of the games we've played in the past is Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories, another Game Boy Advance game. Except this game does that same system, but much better. Yes, it does. You've got this kind of pre-combat section where you're giving chips to Mega Man, which will give him certain attacks, but they are single use. Once you use them, you have to wait until your kind of chip meter refills, and then you can give him more attacks. Uh, his only default moves that he has are his is his Mega Buster, which um, you can charge like in a regular Mega Man, or you can just hammer away at it to shoot, but it's very weak. It doesn't deal a lot of damage even when you charge it relative to the chips so you're kind of focusing on dodging when you've run out of chips or just landing your attacks properly because enemies will uh, vary in how they're when they're vulnerable how they move yeah and you can move across a at least initially three by three grid so you have nine spaces within which to evade the enemy's attack they have at least initially nine spaces to avoid yours yeah, and your attacks have different properties. Like some of them will just be a straight shot that comes out instantly and hits whatever's in front of you. Some will uh, force you to rush towards them. Some are f melee attacks. The enemy has to be directly in front of you. Um, some of them will kind of go around the perimeter. Uh, some will come in from behind. So juggling how you're how you need to line up these attacks and which enemies you want to hit, uh, and you you get ranked based on how many enemies you take out and how fast. So you can get better rankings depending on the more enemies you kill simultaneously and the faster you kill them. This system allows you to strategically pick what um, chips you want, when you want to use them, uh, but it does not burden you with juggling abilities as you're playing. You're mostly playing just a regular action game with this grid system uh, and occasionally sending in chips. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's an interesting bit of like deck building insofar as you can choose your chips, but you're really maxing out your hand each time. Yes. It's like you're given five chips. You can trade in some chips to get more later, but you pretty much want to deploy as many chips as possible as often as possible. Yeah, and it means that when you're picking chips, you're focused on picking chips because you're not dodging attacks at the same time or anything. Yeah. You're, you're allowed to plan, and then the game will kind of unpause as soon as you've picked what moves you want to have access to. So I think that it it makes it makes me so much madder about Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories <laughs> asking you to like watch something in the bottom corner and then also play this action game at the same time and also be focused on all these numbers. This game just 
it gives you the attacks. The attacks always do the same thing. You just need to be focused on actually playing the action game and deploying your attacks properly. There's kind of a strategy mode and an action mode, and the two never shall meet. Did you did you ever have trouble remembering which actions you map to which button presses? Uh, what do you mean actions mapping to button presses? Uh, so like left button does one thing, R does one, A, B. No, I didn't ever map anything to any button other than A. Okay. I just would always put everything on A and then use them all in a row. I didn't even think gotcha. about sequencing. Uh, all right, whatever. I would always plan my moves out so that I would want to use them in a specific sequence. Yeah, that probably makes more sense now that you say that's probably what I should have done. I mean, there's definitely oh, well. a downside to it. Like if yeah. something moves out of the way, it can screw up my plan, and I'd be like, well, I guess i got to throw this chip away. <laughs> Charge it to the game. There'll be more. There's always more. So there's a little bit of customization you get. Early on, it's just kind of picking chips. Uh, I never ran out of memory for Mega Man. I always was just able to add whatever chips I wanted whenever I wanted. Um, but you can level up your memory, level up your HP. Uh, you eventually get access to customization, which is kind of interesting. It, it's almost a Tetris system. I loved it. And maybe that might have been my favorite part of the game, is trying to fit as much on those grids as possible. Yeah, there's rules. Like, you can't have two chips of the same color touching. There's certain chips that have to be on a horizontal line that kind of goes through the middle of this kind of blank Tetris board. It's a 4x4 four four square, I think. Yeah, four by four. it starts out 4x4, four four and then it gets yeah. uh, wider as you play. And then what was the third one? Can't have two types next to each other. Certain commands or certain pieces have to be on that horizontal command line. And other pieces cannot be on that horizontal command line. Yeah. And if you put in uh, something that violates those rules, Mega Man will become bugged. And it will uh, result in Mega Man not performing properly. Debuffs, basically. So you can actually deal with that later. You get mod tools at one point where you can manually fix Mega Man if you screw up how you customized him. Which is, again, like levels of depth that I didn't expect. Mm -hmm. And eventually, as you play, you will get access to styles, which change yes. the way Mega Man plays. Uh, what style did you end up getting? Uh, I mostly focused on wood shield. So they, the styles have an element associated with them. In my case, wood. And then the style, in this case, shield. So what did wood shield give Mega Man? Uh, you could block attacks with your shield as you leveled up. It turned into starting with a barrier, then you get reflect eventually, so you can you know send attacks back. I think there was a heal one as well. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I got wood guts. Mm. With guts mode, your Mega Buster becomes a machine gun. Ooh. So if you mash on the shoot button, he will shoot a machine gun burst instead of just one shot. So that'll deal a good amount of damage all in one big burst, and... I don't know if this is just for wood. His charge became a tornado. I think that is just wood, yeah. Just wood mode. Uh, so the guts mode also increased. It doubled the damage of the Mega Buster. That's good. As well. I was uh, just reading through some FAQs online. Apparently there's ninja style. Have you ever gotten ninja style? I have never. I always get gut style because okay. I, I use the Mega Buster too much. Makes sense. So apparently ninja style is the most mysterious and elusive of all the styles. But nobody could really tell me what it did. I got very curious. I think is that the one where you have to use invisibility all the time? Yeah. Yeah, it it like lets you go invisible more often. Okay. Or you like start the battle invisible, but I didn't find out what invisible even did for you, so it didn't. Yeah, I didn't really bother. I was mostly just mashing attacks. Yeah, I was mostly shooting people. Yeah. That seems what you should do when you have Mega Man, you know? He has a gun for an arm. Yep. It's not for hugging. <laughs> What is – what's the backstory of Mega Man? He's Lan's twin that died. Yeah. Well, spoil, spoilers. Reincarnated? Oh, sorry. I mean, what? It's not even mentioned in this game. It is revealed later in the game. So Lan – Mega Man is, is Lan's twin brother who died as an infant, and his father reincarnated him as Mega Man. He converted his soul to Data and made him Mega Man. So what happens – we're sort of drifting in a story territory, but these were questions I had. I think we covered most of the yeah. gameplay stuff. Uh, the boss chips are all cool. So what happens when a net navi gets deleted? Is he gone forever? I think if they if they really get deleted, they're dead. 
So, like, if Mega Man beats somebody in battle, they're not deleted. They're just defeated? Yeah. When you beat the, like, evil net navvies, then he's yeah. deleting them. They explode. It's a whole thing. So he's basically killing everybody. He's killing all the viruses, and he's killing the bad guys. But, like, the, the net navvies are sentient. Yes. Like, this is murder. He's taking Mega lives. Man's a murderer, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure I was clear on what was happening here. Yeah, he's making the world a better place one death at a time. <laughs> Mega Man's hard. This whole game's hardcore. It is. And let's go to that because this game facially, I mean, it's it's based on an anime series, uh, the Mega Man Battle Network shows, which were on WB for me, like the WB Saturday yeah, morning cartoon Saturday block. Saturday morning cartoon lineup, yeah. Uh, so I was a pretty religious watcher of the show, and that's what got me into this game in the first place. And that that show is pretty lighthearted. Uh, there's not too much raw going on in that show that I remember. Maybe maybe it was more serious than I remember. But uh, this sh- game starts off that way. Uh, the very first villain you fight, it, like brainwashes your team into dancing till they die, basically. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Which also is pretty raw. But not, yeah, not but that light. bad. I mean, there's there are no guns like in Magic Pendulum, at least. Yeah, uh, he's you know trying to steal a code from your school. That's not too bad. Um, but then the second dude you run into from WWW from the World Wide Wily mind controls animals at the zoo and sets them loose. Yeah, and threatens to kill everyone with mind controlled lions. And a condor snatches a small child. And takes him atop, like, a radio antenna? Yeah, and and just dangles him up there. And then at the end of the encounter, he falls off of the radio antenna, thankfully into the arms of his brother. But he would have died. Um, And it's also worth mentioning, like, his brother and him, they they live in separate houses because his brother, his parent, their parents are divorced. And that's a major... Yeah, it's a big plot point. Yeah, eventually they move with sort of no discussion of what's going on or these family dynamics or anything, which, you know, people live in this way, but for a Mega Man game, seems odd. Yeah, it it was pretty intense. Like, the third boss, and and this is where I think the Internet of Things kind of comes in, because this game is very, very focused on everything being digitized and then many things being networked. Yes, everything is connected, and it's a huge cybersecurity problem, as we're all finding out now yeah so the in some ways the most fictional thing i found about this game was the idea that there are a lot of environments a lot of objects that have uh ports that you can jack into but are not networked like that's the most unbelievable thing (laughs) like you can jack into your dog house and it's a, a digital guard dog and it's there's no net connection you can't get to the larger internet um, and that's actually where you get most – it's almost like treasure chests. Um, if you can find the net, the objects that are digita- digitized but do not have a network connection, they tend to have treasure chests in them and like one or two navvies or programs that are just stuck in there doing menial tasks. It is always interesting too to see the way like cybersecurity structures are narrativized, like especially in sort of like cyberpunk texts. So like Mega Man's basically – He's basically McCaffrey internet security. Yeah. Like, he's an antivirus program, and it's just that this game has conceptualized it as, like, literal avatars that fight. Yep. Whereas, like, you know, Neuromancer, one of, like, the great cyber cyberpunk texts, thought of it as ice that you had to, like, drill through, and it could freeze you. Or, like, Snow Crash had roving digital samurai that you had to deal with. It's always weird because, like, cybersecurity is sort of inherently boring on the surface. It's really all just zeros and ones. Speak for yourself. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. It's boring to, like, see. I get, Like, if you had to, like, write a book where somebody was just coding, it wouldn't be a very exciting book. Probably not. And that's why in most movies they dramatize it with, like, a giant screen with numbers just flying right. over it at all times. And then you have to show whatever's happening yeah, or like Agent Smith in the Matrix. Like that's he's basically cybersecurity, and again they've rendered it as a persona that fights. It's just like 
hand to hand combat is cybersecurity now. And in this game, you're basically just roving around deleting viruses and bad navvies. Yeah. The whole Internet of Things is that all of, there are so many objects that have some digital component to them uh, with programs running on them, and you can go in there, you can get items. One, some of the biggest problems in this game is that each of these things, each of these environments that should probably not have a network has a network. And because it has a network, some nefarious bad actor is able to seize control of that network and then terrorize people. Yeah, like why... Why, like, the operating room in the local hospital is just sort of, like, connected to loose Wi-Fi is beyond me. Yeah, and that's um, – the first place you go is the school, and the school gets taken over, and that, like, screws with the lights and, you know, maybe some people's grades. Not that big of a deal. Second one, because the animals have chips in them for monitoring. Yeah, the animals themselves have chips. That's insane. Yeah. And because they seize control of the network, they seize control of the animals, which, like, I want to say all of this is completely fictional. But have you ever heard the story of how uh, Iran's centrifuges, when they were back I like, have. enriching uranium, how that went bad for them? Mm -hmm. I have. Yeah. Do you want to tell the story? Or? No, Gina. You brought it up. I would love to hear you tell it. Sure. So uh, Iran's nuclear program was marching ahead at a very rapid pace in the – uh, mid 2000s 2000 or i guess 2008 2009 2010 like that period right before the iran nuclear deal yeah. um they were moving ahead and and people were very concerned about how much enriched uranium they were going to have and almost you know getting close to having a bomb and the way that we were able that their program was slowed down significantly was a hack that went through some object their centrifuges were off the network Mm -hmm. They were isolated, basically, they were isolated. on their own. They were not on the internet. Yes. Like a thumb drive or some some port on an object that was near them was on the internet. Mm -hmm. And we basically launched a hack just some lo-fi way by, like, creating a network and bridging into the centrifuges and then making, like, I believe U.S. hackers. So, some hack, I think it was U.S. Um, yeah, I, I think you're correct. Turned the centrifuges up. Turned yes. up the speed and it ruined them. It broke all their centrifuges. Mm -hmm. You know what the, the the most interesting thing to my mind though is like as they turned up the centrifuges to break them, the monitoring units were still being fed data that like everything's good, centrifuges doing great. So like it's this weird disconnect where the physical system is subservient to whatever digital signals it puts out. Like we take the data to be more true than whatever physical situation it's trying to describe. Yeah, I mean, didn't uh, an Uber self-driving car kill someone because it thought because someone was crossing outside of a crosswalk, it must not be a person? Yeah. One of the ones that gets me, too, is always, like, the big data applications that, like, we construct these algorithms that mine data, but we don't really know exactly how the algorithms work. So they spit out this stuff, and we're like, hey, the algorithm said it. Must be true. Like, so whatever it is, that's the case. Yeah, it, it, it's a lot of wild stuff. And they predicted all this in 2002 in a Mega Man game. Yeah, and, like, the the first two things are a little bit ridiculous. The third one is that there's a – the third boss is Bubble Man, and one of your friends gets a dish uh, washing machine yeah. or a dishwasher, a dishwasher that is net-enabled. It gets hacked by Bubble Man, and Bubble Man causes the washing machine to create bubbles that are big, impenetrable, and explode. <laughs> Which, like, kudos to Bubble Man. Like, that's some serious tech. Yeah, he doesn't have an operator. He's just, he's he's just, just out there. Loops. He's free. Yeah, and that that's a pretty rough situation. Like, you can't hack into the washing machine because the port is blocked, but it's been set up on the Wi-Fi somehow. So you can't get on its network. You have to take down Bubble, Bubble Man instead. Then the next encounter is, oh, yeah, a studio, a TV studio that runs the traditional uh, Shonen tournament. And mm -hmm. this one is the N1 Grand Prix. Turns out that the producer of the TV show is a member of the World Wide Wiley. He's a double agent. And he's trying to put propaganda out that his that Wiley's back and he 
gets the number one net battler in the world to submit to him by kidnapping and ransoming his father. Yeah. yeah. Chod or, or Chode, as you call him. Yep. And it's, I mean, Chod's situation is also really messed up. Did you yeah. remember the cutscene with his dad? Oh, yeah. It's, and it's like, it's, it comes out of nowhere. It's never discussed again. So, like, Sho is out just looking forlornly into the ocean. And his dad comes up. He's like, hey, bro, what you call me for? And, like, I forget exactly what Sho said. But he his says, dad, I'm, like, in the fin- I'm going to yes. be in the finals of this big tournament. And his dad's like, why are you wasting time talking to me? You should be training. You idiot. Yeah. I only acknowledge the strong. And then he walks off. He, he basically says, you idiot. Why would you bring me here? Talk to me when you've won. Yeah. Which, yeah, abusive dad. Darkly abusive dad. Yes. And it's a one-off cutscene. It's not, like, integral to the story. Yeah, it comes up at, like, the end of the game, when I was like, I think I saved the world. I helped save the world, Dad. And he's like, you can eat with me tonight. <laughs> Dad, I can I can have dinner with you, Papa? <laughs> Don't yes. make me reconsider. And then he yeah, leaves. Bring your own food. Yeah, I was just going to get to the next absurd subplot. We're after, after Bubble Man. Are we at the hospital now? Uh, so after Desert Man, which is the producer, then we're in the hospital where there's a hospital. And one of the operators for WWW is a – she's a young girl who believes that they're doing eco-terrorism. Mm-hmm. And, and she's she wants all to, Yeah. And she's on board. She's all for that avalanche, some FF8, av, uh, FF7 avalanche style stuff. She is wrecking, uh, polluting industries, like shutting down power plants. Direct action. Yep. Uh, and she needs to, she's told to take down this hospital yeah. because she needs a code that will help take down this techno society that's ruining the planet. Before that, though, you meet a dying young boy who has been through so many surgeries that haven't helped him. That he now refuses this new surgery that could save his life. And it's your job to convince him to get this surgery. And you meet him and talk to him and he tells you that he can't – the thing he loves most is net battling and that's why he's a fan of LAN. But he can't anymore because the doctors are concerned if he does it, the excitement would kill him. Yeah. This is all heartbreaking. And it's in the middle of a Mega Man game. Yeah, and then the next sequence is the hospital being taken over by plants and almost killing everyone in it. Yeah. You talk to her, and she's like, sacrifices must be made. Yeah. She's not even, like, the main villain. She's a one-off character that's murdering everybody in a hospital. And then there's um, Heat Man, or Mr. Match, and Heat Man, or Flame Man. Uh, Flame Man. He convinces you to basically spread a virus all over your dad's office basically so he can cook your dad alive yes people are dying (laughs) when heat man or flame man heats up the the research laboratory two to 200 degrees so basically he tricks lan into almost killing his father which sends lan spiraling into this horrible depression until eventually he's like i need to work to right these wrongs yeah this game is a lot it is hardcore. Like, any one of these could have been enough for, like, a whole thing. This is a children's game. Yeah, like, who is this for? It's rated E for everyone. <laughs> yeah, this is for everybody. It's, like, weirdly, like, cliched heartwarming, but, like, it gets to it in such a weird route. Like, the messages are still, like, oh, like, work hard, like, get back on the horse, like, friendship is the most important thing. But, like, how does it teach you these lessons? By almost killing your father. How does it teach you a hard lesson about uh, the difficulties of environmentalism and balancing direct action with uh, the concerns of industries and and people who have to live their normal lives? You know, a lesson children need. Wide-scale (laughs) eco-terrorism with lives hanging in the balance. Yeah, this, like, it's weirdly hardcore. And that's even before you, like, remember that Mega Man is the reincarnated soul of a dead child who's now responsible for policing the internet. And at the end of – did you see the final cutscene of this game? Do you know how it ends? I, I don't know specifically. No, I didn't make it that far. So Alpha, this uh, virus that 
you're trying to stop that Wily unleashes. First of all, it consumes Wily. I did know that. He becomes one with the one with the new flesh. How does it access Wily? Unclear to me. I did not see that cutscene, but it seems that Lan, the the physical and the digital become fused in a way that is un unsettling. Do you think it's in a uh, an Akira reference? Probably. Well, I mean, it looks like Akira. Yeah. Alpha looks like out. It's this giant fleshy looking thing. Yeah. That takes over uh, the network. After you defeat him, you. Go to a room where you meet Dr. Light from Mega Man fame, mm-hmm. um, and he is Land's grandpa, and you learn that he made, you know, he made the network and made Alpha, but then Dr. Wily used it for evil. Um, and as you're leaving, after you've learned this, Lan and Mega Man get captured and sucked into Alpha, and he is going to hold them in there until he's deleted, because he's dying. And it will delete them both and kill them. So Mega Man uses the last of his energy to explode a section of of Alpha to free Lan. And so Mega Man kills himself to save Lan. Hmm. He sacrifices himself to save his twin brother. Of course he does. I assume he survives somehow. No, I mean he. I mean he doesn't in this game. Maybe in. I mean, there's a Battle Network four, and I think it's still Land. So maybe he comes back in four, but by the end of three, he does not come back in the cutscene that I saw. He's he's gone. I mean, it's foreshadowed when Sho tells him that like you could lose Mega Man in this like quest to stop Alpha. Yeah, but that's heavy. That that is heavy, and there's a whole lot of heavy stuff in this game. It, it's impressive. I think, like, so, like, the original Mega Man games are notorious for their, like, platforming difficulty, like, the actual difficulty of the gameplay. Maybe they were like, look, our original games were super hard to play. We're just going to make this one super hard emotionally. Yeah, it's going to, it's going to break you emotionally. We'll take all that platforming difficulty and we'll just channel it to horrible, horrible things happening to everybody in the game. Which I'm all for. It's it's an interesting approach. It definitely is. Yeah, and I would say that this game, I hadn't played it in 15 years probably, and it 100% holds up. It, it's, it more than holds up. Like, it's gotten more and more relevant over time. It's gotten better. It's crazy. I would say the only things that are really dated about it are its side quests. Like, some of the oh, yeah. actual quest design can be annoying. Like, there's a lot of fet- questy stuff. Mm-hmm. But the load times are very fast, and the world is relatively small, so even those aren't that oppressive. Um, there's some bullshit with, like, finding items or trading in items occasionally. Like, people will ask you to get a specific chip, and there's no way to buy it. You just need to grind uh, encounters until you beat one with like an S ranking and then you get the item you need which can be annoying because you can't just seek out the specific enemy you want to deal with but even that you know what, what one thing I found very odd about the game not necessarily like bad just sort of clumsy is anytime anybody asks a question like oh where are we going to find this what do we do now you immediately get an email containing the answer to that exact question well, yes, yeah. They they always go one, two, or like you... Oh, gosh, say, where are we going to find X? Email! Oh, you're looking for X. It's kind of their way of doing a quest log. Yeah, like I said, it's not, it's not bad, because it's better than just sort of like stumbling around haphazardly. It is very clumsy and overt, though. Yeah, and I do think it's also very funny that they've got like a message board, a, a job board where you can take on side quests, and then there's a message board in the game like in the town centers in the digital world and those will have a bunch of helpful hints and stuff as well like in a forum thread which i think is pretty fun it's weird too that like this game is so like prescient and so many things it's saying about the internet of things and like the problems of networking and yet there's still like a classified page in the town center like they couldn't just do that online (laughs) yeah and then they have all of the all the digitized versions of the real world, which are fun. Yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of park equipment in the center of town, and so you see digitized versions of all that park equipment, like a digital squirrel. 
<laughs> Gino, who is your favorite ridiculous Navi? So of the, I mean, Beast Man's fun. Beast Man's good. I like Beast Man. I like his claws. I like that he gets up close and personal. Mm-hmm. He's pretty good. What was your favorite? I think in terms of just like sheer absurdity and the fact that he's like a fairly high level boss in the game. I think Bowl Man is the most crazy. What is his deal? He's like bowling, like the sport of bowling. Like oh. one of his arms is just a pin that shoots bowling balls. And he's – so like eventually you have to increase your ranking in the undernet. Yes. It's basically the dark web All of right, this there place. There is a dark web. Yeah, there's a dark web called the undernet that's basically inaccessible in the same way you need a Tor browser to get on like the dark web. But he's number two. He's the second highest ranked person in all of the Undernet. And he's Bowl Man. Yeah, they're, some of the designs in this game are good. I love Desert Man and his – every time he gets shot, he turns into sand. Yeah, he's good too. Like Flame Man's evil, but he's he's great. Yeah, the designs are really – I love how they translated the – old Mega Man designs yeah. into this new game. I was going to say, it's definitely vintage Mega Man, where they're like, what sort of ridiculous thing can we add man to the end of and make a thing? Yeah. This game's really good. I, I recommend it, it wholeheartedly. It's, it's like, like, it's weirdly good. Yeah. It, it's super prescient. Uh, the storyline somehow gets darker and more <laughs> yeah. grounded. With every second. Yeah, the further you go, and they... This is like – like the anime is not that – I don't remember it being that good. It was pretty generic. I, I don't. I was always more of a Metabots kind of guy back then. Why choose? I have both. That's a good point. That's a good point. I used to play the Metabots game a lot. I have the Metabots game too. We can we can play the Metabots game at some point. Yeah, we have to come around on that one. Yep. But yeah, I would say like the, the music's good too as all Mega Man games must have good music. Really, the only weak points are occasionally some – just quest designs demand too much time of you. Like what stopped me was this is a game where you can get game overs and I just forgot to save uh, and ran into an enemy that just I was sloppy and died and lost a half hour because of like a fetch quest. And there's a section of the game where you need to do like four fetch quests in a row and they all suck. So that kind of deadened my momentum. But up until that point, this game is just super solid. Yeah. Um, the only problems I would say with are just like old school design like it mm. pads in a lot of hours there's a lot of just ran, running into random battles but you can even turn those off yeah you get an, event, an upgrade eventually yeah you get an upgrade that turns off all random battles with weak opponents mm-hmm. which is super useful and the world is surprisingly alive like there's a lot of characters to talk to they usually have stuff to say that can be interesting way to go Mega Man Battle Network ton of interesting stuff to say about Basically, online life and what happens when you know these programs assume, in this case, they're literal minds of their own, but when the sort of programs run afoul of human control. Yeah, and about what that does to interactions. Like one of the very first interactions you have in the very first mission is you and your friends are at school and you say, okay, let's talk at 8. All right, where should we meet? Uh, let's meet in the digital version of of the town uh, of the park in like the center of town it's like well why don't we just like meet up in person we all live on the same block <laughs> yeah like we can see the park from our houses yeah but instead everyone meets up online it's great so i think that's all i've got to say about mega man battle network 3 blue version yeah i have nothing to add for white i mean it's pretty much exactly the same except for i think two boss differences I think there's a boss difference, and you also had slight differences in the uh, chips that were sold at shops. Okay. Which annoyed the hell out of me because there was one chip, the Yo-Yo G, I think, that you yeah. need to get for one quest, and apparently you could buy it, and I, <laughs> I had nice. to get it the old-fashioned way. Nice. By killing. <laughs> That's how I get all my resources. I don't even bring my lunch to work anymore. I just kill for it. Yep. I just assume someone else will bring will bring something, and I take it from them by force. All right. So I think that's it for Mega Man Battle Network 3. A uh, reminder, you can get in touch with the show at DeepListensPod on Twitter, deeplistens.libsyn.com. We've got our comment sections and deeplistenspodcast at gmail.com. 
you can also support the show at patreon.com slash deep listens. Uh, please do so. It helps us keep this show going, and we always love to have new people in the Discord. Thank you, Pete. Yeah, happy to be here to discuss a game that had a lot of cool things to say and sexual innuendos. So I was on board. Yeah, there were. Yep, that was also weird. Yep. And Lan just he he can't understand. No, nope, doesn't get it. And we have for the next one. It was M's turn to pick, and she picked Katana Zero. Yes, a great title for what looks to be a great game. Yes, so we are looking forward to playing that. So next time will be Katana Zero. Thank you, listeners. Till next time, peace. Peace.